Thank you very much, uh, Gunnar. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in Leuven, and I would like to thank uh, Gunnar and Carol, and of course, George, for inviting me here to this wonderful city to discuss with you how we should manage our babies in the delivery room during a uh, pulmonary transition. I'm going to focus on if and how much pressure and oxygen we should deliver to our babies in these first few minutes of life. Now, I guess before we can discuss intervention, it's essential to understand normal physiology. So how would pelvic transition normally occur? So we're going to spend some time discussing with you the processes, the mechanisms that take place during normal pelvic transition in the term baby. Um, I think we all appreciate the unique environment that the human fetus is in uh, compared to extrauterine life. And if you look at the lung more specifically, it's quite a different uh, organ in terms of function compared to extrauterine life as the lung is not involved in gas exchange, um, which is governed by the placenta. And in fact, the lung is a fluid-filled organ in utero. There's no reason to perfuse the lung as there's no gas exchange. So this is dampened, this perfusion, by the relatively high pulmonary vascular resistance in utero. And in fact, the fetus, as you heard yesterday also, is in relatively hypoxic environment in utero. So the primary focus of the lung actually is on lung development and not on lung gas exchange. So let's take a closer look at lung development. So the fluid-filled lung is actually essential to create a lung distension, which is again critical for normal lung development. And the fluid is secreted by the alveolar epithelial cells via a chloride-mediated activity. And this is a study done in uh, fetal lambs showing the secretion rate on the y-axis and the gestational age on the x-axis. And you can see that there is a gradual increase in secretion rate by these epithelial cells as the lung grows uh, close to uh, at the end of gestation where it levels off uh, at a stable secretion rate. But it's not just the fluid itself, it's the interaction between the fluid and the fetal breathing movements and also the resistance created by the upper airways that actually gives you the optimal lung distension that is needed for normal lung development. And in this study, again, in fetal lambs, they teased out the contribution of these fetal breathing movements and the upper airway resistance in this total picture of lung distension. So what you see here is the percentage of lung distension in normal situations, so with fluids, intact fetal breathing movements, and upper airway resistance, and this is set at 100%. So if you take away normal fetal breathing movements by paralyzing the diaphragm, you will see that you will lose about 20% of your lung distension. And if you add to this removal of the upper airway resistance, you will get another drop of about 20%, leading up to about 60% of normal lung distension in these fetal lambs. And just for putting things in perspective, this is actually the postnatal air-filled FRC in our babies, which is about half of the distension that you have in the fetal lung. So at the time of birth, you have this extremely complex situation that you're going from a fluid-filled lung focusing on development to an air-filled lung focusing on gas exchange. And this is a very complex uh, process. Now, to make this a success, there are sort of basic requirements that need to be fulfilled. First of all, we need to establish adequate ventilation. And for this, the fluid needs to be cleared from the lung. And it needs to be replaced by air, and we need to establish a normal functional residual capacity. And finally, we need spontaneous breathing to get refreshment of the air. In addition to this, we need normal perfusion. So we need a rapid reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance after birth to get normal perfusion combined with an adequate cardiac output. So let's take a look how things normally would go. So these are the transitions in term babies with spontaneous vaginal delivery. First of all, we need to clear the fluids from the lung, and this is a process that already starts at the time of labor. There's a transition 
in the function of the alveolar epithelial cells, which in utero are secreting fluids, but they tend to they, they, they transition to a sodium and fluid absorbing cell prior to labor. Um, and this is a very important step in transitioning the lung from interuterine to exuterine life. As shown in these experiments in uh, knockout mice who lack these sodium channels. And as you can see compared to wild types, if you look at the fluid clearance, uh, it's much less in the white bars indicating the knockout mice, indicated here by the wet dry ratio. So they, these mice do not clear the fluid as efficient as the wild type. And if you look at the Kaplan-Meier survival curve, you can see that most of these mice who don't have these sodium channels, they actually die within the first two days of life. So what makes this transition of these epithelial cells going from a secretion cell to an absorbing cell? What probably is the, a key hormone here is epinephrine. And these are, again, studies done in the fetal lamb where they measure the lung liquid volume, which tends to increase over time. But if you infuse these lungs with epinephrine, you will see that you get a drop in lung volume. So epinephrine, which is also a high concentration at the start of labor, plays an important role in transitioning these cells from secreting fluid to absorbing fluid. And it's just not, the, not just the epinephrine, probably, but there is an interaction there with thyroid hormone, hydrocortisone, and vasopressin. So the second mechanism by which we are, are clearing the fluid from the lungs is what we call the mechanical thoracic squeeze. So if the baby is in utero and there are these contractions, and if the baby moves through the birth channel, you are squeezing the thorax, and part of the fluid is excreted in this process. And the pressures you get on this thorax are actually quite high in some of these babies. Still, the majority of the fluids are still remaining in the lung at the time that the baby is actually born, which means that clearing this fluid and aerating the lung is for the majority taking place after birth by uh, these first postnatal breaths the baby takes. So the group of Weiss and Miller did these really cool studies many, many years ago in, pre in term babies who uh, were spontaneously delivered. And what they did is as soon as the baby's head was born, they put in catheters measuring esophageal pressure, they put on a mask, and measuring pressure and volume. And this way they could draw the volume pressure relationship with volume on the y-axis and pressure on the x-axis during the first breath in these babies. So this is the inspiration phase and this is the expiration phase. So let's take a closer look at these first breaths. What's really interesting is that as soon as the baby starts to breathe in, as indicated by generating a negative pressure, you will see there's an influx of uh, volume of air. So there doesn't seem to be a sort of a critical opening pressure you have to overcome before air is entering the lung. Secondly, if you look at the negative pressure that these babies generate, these are huge. Mine is 50 centimeters of water and some babies up to 100 centimeters of water, negative pressure during this first breath. Eventually, this first breath leads up to a tidal volume of about 10 ml per kilo. And then you get this really strange expiratory phase where they generate these huge expiratory uh, uh, positive pressures inside the lung going up to a medium of about 70 centimeters of water. And finally, at the end of this first breath, about 5 ml per kilo of the inspired tidal volume remains in the lung and this is the first step in building up the FRC. So Arjen Tapas, who was a colleague of mine in Leiden and who worked in Melbourne at Colin Morley's uh, uh, clinic, also looked at these breathing patterns, especially the expiratory phase in these term babies. So what they did is they measured the flow and volume in all babies during the first few minutes of life, term babies, um, by a, a mask put on, uh, on the mouth. Um, just to show you what you get is a flow signal indicated here in green and a volume signal indicated in blue. 
This is what we call normal breathing. We have an inspiratory phase, a very short insp and inspiratory pause. Then you have your expiratory phase with a very short uh, post-expiratory uh, uh, pause. Now, if you look at the breathing patterns of term babies immediately after birth, you have a quite a different flow signal. Again, you see the, in green here the inspiratory flow. There is a little release of air here, and then you see there's almost zero flow for a very long period of time. So at this point in time, there's an expiration hold by the baby, at which time the baby creates these very high pressures. Then you see a very rapid exhalation, followed immediately by a new inspiration, and again, this expiratory hold. Could also be that you have this expiratory hold combined with crying. Again shown here, a short inspiratory phase and a slow release of volume over a long period of time. And here you can see these vibrations of the vocal cords, which we know is crying. And finally, which we also see a lot in our babies, you can have grunting, again, sort of a variation to crying, expiratory breaking or holding with these vocal uh, uh, um, um, uh, vibrations. So when he analyzed uh, all of these expiratory breathing patterns in these uh, term babies, what he found was that actually only a small percentage of the breathing is actually normal breathing. And most of these babies have what we call expiratory breaking, with crying being the most prominent one. So the reason why these babies are breaking expiration is probably to push the fluid that's still in the lung distally so it can be transferred to the interstitial and taken up by the vascular bed and in the minority of the lymphatic tissue. It's also important to counteract the elastic recoils of the lung and to counteract the increased surface tension. Because now when we go from a fluid-filled lung to an air-filled lung, we are creating an air-liquid interface and we know that this will increase our surface tension. Now, luckily, there's this great substance called surfactants, which seems to help the baby in stabilizing the lung at this new uh, air-liquid interface. And it's been shown in human fetuses that from about 27, 28 weeks, you get a slow increase in the surfactant in the amniotic fluid, preparing the baby for the time at birth, helping the baby to lower the surface tensions as the air-liquid interface is created with these first uh, postnatal breaths. And in addition to this, there is a surge of surfactant stored in the type 2 cells that is released in reaction to the stretch, stretch on these cells during these first um, the big inspirations, as shown in, this in, in ex vivo uh, cell cultures, looking at uh, PC secretion, uh, which seems to increase as you increase the stretch or the, the, the diameter of these uh, cells. So once we've cleared the fluid, we established uh, an air field, FRC, we also need to get optimal perfusion of the lung. And this is a study done many, many years ago, uh, combining several observations in human fetuses, showing that if you look at the pulmonary pressures, there's a rapid decrease um, as the babies are born, allowing for normal pulmonary perfusion and optimizing uh, um, uh, um, the uh, um, interface of the uh, gas exchange in the alveolar capital interface. So why is pulmonary vascular resistance dropping at birth? Well, there are many theories about this. Some feel that by expanding the lung, you get sort of an unkinking of these pulmonary vessels. Of course, we know that improved oxygenation will probably release nitric oxide, which has a, a positive effect on reducing pulmonary vascular resistance. And there are many other stress-induced releases of prostaglandins, which also uh, participate in this process. So if you look at this very complex transition, it's not that unlogical that it takes time for the baby to adapt to this new situation. And it wasn't very realistic that what we thought many years ago, that the baby should turn pink within a minute after birth it's actually quite realistic that it takes time. And in, at least in the last decades, many investigators across the world have looked at what actually happens with oxygenation as a sort of a, 
an endpoint for pulmonary transition if you let a baby born and do not assist this baby uh, by any way during uh, transition. And it's clearly shown that it takes several minutes, up to four minutes, in most of the term babies spontaneously delivered before they reach uh, saturations of about 90%. So to summarize this part of spontaneous delivery at term and pulmonary transition, we have fluid clearance that already starts before birth. Um, we know that expiry breaking and surfactant release are very important, if not the important part of creating a normal air-filled FRC. And it takes several minutes before you get out of oxygenation in uh, babies uh, at term. And the most important message, I guess, is that in case of an uncomplicated delivery at term, pulmonary nitrogen is a very spontaneous process that does not need any assistance. So what about the mode of delivery? If we have a term baby that's delivered by a cesarean section, are things different compared to the vaginal route? Well, there are some indication that there probably is a difference. This is a cohort study done in a group of uh, uh, pregnant women who were either delivered by an intended cesarean section or by vaginal birth. And if they look at the need to support these babies in the delivery room during resuscitation, they could show that if you look at the number of babies that need oxygen or the numbers of babies that need pressure, this is increased in those babies who are born by, by cesarean section, especially if it is not preceded by uh, active labor. Um, so why is this? Well, there might be a less efficient fluid clearance from these babies by the sodium channels. And there are some indications in this by some studies done many years ago where they measured potential differences at the nasal epithelial cells, which is a reflection of the respiratory epithelial cells, showing that if you look at the potential differences, which are a measure of ion transport across the membranes, that this is indeed uh, a difference between those babies who are either born vaginally or C-section after labor compared to those babies who are born by C-section without previous labor. Um, we also think that there might be a less efficient mechanical fluid clearance uh, in these babies and therefore a less efficient formation of an air-filled FRC. Again, studies by, done by the group by Weiss and Miller showing the different pressures you get in either babies born by elective C-section or by uh, vaginal delivery. And if they look at the delivery pressure, so these pressures that squeeze out some of these fluids as the baby moves to the birth channel, um, you can see that these pressures are uh, almost halved in those babies that are born by elective C-section. And if you look at the excitatory breaking of these babies, it's also reduced in those babies born by elective C-section. And in the end, this will reduce the buildup of the FRC in these first few breaths. And if you look at this over a longer period of time, you can see that most of these babies are born after C-section. Uh, they lag behind in building up their FRC. It takes them somewhat longer to get the normal FRC uh, of the lung. And this is also reflected if you look at the Oxygenation changes after birth, again at one to five minutes, vaginal birth, C-section, SpO2s, and you can see that the ones with C-section are always lagging behind somewhat up to five minutes with the babies born after vaginal delivery. So yes, there seems to be a difference depending on the mode of delivery and probably also depending on if the, womb, uh, the mother was in labor before C-section takes place. And there are factors that we discussed here, and it takes a longer time for the FRC to be built up and to get normal oxygenation. But still, in most of these babies at term, we probably do not need to assist pulmonary transition. It just takes them a few minutes longer to transition to an air-filled lung. Okay, so what about the asphyxiated term baby? Well, here we have a problem because most of these babies do not have sufficient or adequate breathing, which means they're probably less efficient in clearing the fluid because we need spontaneous breathing to clear the fluid from the lung. Um, so clinicians probably need to assist 
this pulmonary transition in these babies. And I guess the first priority should be to establish a normal FRC and normal ventilation. So the group of Weiser and Miller also looked at these babies, asphyxiated babies at term, and they looked at the first breath. What they did, these babies were not spontaneously breathing, so they applied a pre-pressure of 30 centimeters of water in a rate of about 30 to 40 per minute, providing an eye time of one second. Now here you again have the volume on the y-axis and the pressure on the x-axis. Now as these are positive pressure breaths, because the baby is not spontaneous breathing, you have an increase in pressure and what you see now is that you need a certain pressure you have to reach before air is entering the lungs. So now in contrast to spontaneous breathing, we seem to have a sort of a critical opening pressure before air can enter the lung. If they looked at most of these babies, most of the babies had a, a critical open pressure which was higher than 20 centimeters of water. If you look at the volume that was reached, it was only half of what was reached in those babies with spontaneous breathing. And if you look at the FRC, it was also half compared to babies um, with spontaneous breathing. So it seems that supporting the baby with positive pressure during transition is not as effective as it is if the baby is spontaneously breathing. What they also showed was that many of these babies that were supported by a mask and positive breath showed some reflexes. And the first reflexes they showed was what they call a rejection response. So there was an expiratory effort by the baby in response to a positive breath. The second reflex was the Hatz paradoxical reflex, which was an inspiratory effort the baby got in response to the positive breath. And finally, what they showed is that in most babies, FRC only really reached the optimal FRC once these babies started to get spontaneous breathing, as this is probably more efficient. Now, when they did these experiments, they, they were triggered by the fact that after the first second, so remember there were one second inspiration times with 30 centimeters of water, there was still volume, air entering the lung. So they started to think maybe if we would, could prolong the inspiration time, we can increase the volume that's actually entering the lung. And this is what they did in these additional uh, studies. Again, term asphyxiated babies, no spontaneous breathing, a peak pressure of 30, but now they increased the inspiration time to what we would call a sort of a sustained inflation time, three to five seconds. And what they could show is again, there was an opening pressure, but this tended to be lower compared to the shorter inspiration times. And now they were able to reach a normal inspiratory tidal volume and a normal FRC buildup after the first breath. And I guess this was the basis for where we got the interest in applying a sustained inflation in our babies. What about the oxygen? Well, I guess this is undisputed. I guess we don't need to spend much time on this. It's been shown clearly in asphyxiated babies that we need to resuscitate these babies with room air, as this will give you a reduction in a death at latest follow-up compared to 100% of oxygen. So to summarize this for the asphyxiated term baby, um, most of these babies require a certain opening pressure above 20 to 25 centimeters of water to actually get the air in and to try to establish FRC. A sustained inflation up to five seconds lowers these opening pressures and it really improves the volume again you get in the lung. But if you look at if this really matters for these babies on the long term, there are no randomized controlled trials in term babies looking at a sustained inflation uh, versus a normal short inspiration time ventilation strategy. Um, and as I said previously, we should resuscitate all our asphyxiated babies uh, with uh, room air. Okay, so let's move on to the last category and the most um, the prominent one in our units, and this is the preterm baby. Now, if you look at the physiology it's clear that we might expect that these preterm babies are compromised in their normal pulmonary transition. 
First of all, many of these babies, and especially the babies with RDS, seem to have a reduced sodium channel activity. Again, shown here in studies done by measuring the potential difference on the nasal epithelial cells, and showing here that the RDS babies indicated by the uh, black uh, um, symbols here have a, uh, a reduced iron flux uh, compared to term babies. Many of our babies are surfactant deficient, which means that they lack this ability to lower the surface tension of the air-liquid interface that is created during pulmonary transition. They probably have a reduced muscle strength, so maybe they can't build up these high inspiratory and expiratory pressures that are needed to clear the fluid from the lung. They have a very complex thorax or chest wall, which makes breathing very ineffective. So there are many reasons why uh, normal permanent transitions can be compromised and that the, uh, the fluid clearance in the FRC is probably delayed in these preterm infants. On the other hand, most of our babies are pretreated with antenatal steroids and we know that steroids upregulate sodium channel activity and we know that it will uh, increase uh, both biochemical and structural maturation of the premature lung. So this is probably why still, although there are factors compromising transition, many of our preterm babies actually manage to transition quite well after birth. Still, if you look at oxygenation again as a reflection of pulmonary transition, it is clear from the data that with these reference values in the percentiles that if you compare the time needed to reach in a, a saturation of 90%, it's several minutes, uh, uh, takes several minutes longer in the preterm infant compared to the term infant. So one of the key questions is, should we apply sustained inflation or PEEP at preterm infants during pulmonary transition? And if you look at the ILCOR guidelines, they state that there's insufficient evidence to make very firm recommendations. However, they tell us that in the apneic preterm infant, you might apply a peak pressure, about 20, 25 centimeters of water, using, in some cases, a longer inspiration time, and it's likely that PEEP is beneficial. So it's pretty vague, um, um, and it's really tough to deal with this in clinical practice. So what should we do? Well, if you look at these breathing patterns that I showed you for the term babies, these expiratory breathing patterns, in the first minutes after birth, and you look at the uh, breakdown of certain patterns, you can see that also in the preterm infant, many of these babies are uh, capable of breaking expiration, um, having very similar after uh, um, um, breaking, in, in, uh, but the most prominent one being crying, as with the term baby. So it seems to be that if the baby is spontaneously breathing, it might actually be quite uh, good at at, at, at creating the FRC uh, uh, in the lung. Um, if you look at evidence uh, to support the use of sustained inflation and PEEP, to my knowledge there are three studies that look at a, a randomization between sustained inflation and no sustained inflation. The first two studies are actually quite small, uh, looking at babies 27 to 28 weeks, comparing sustained inflations, two versus five seconds, or Littner uh, comparing 15 seconds to no sustained inflation, using relatively normal or precious 20, 25 up to 30. All these babies also received PEEP. They used different devices and different interfaces, but looking at mostly short-term outcomes, these small studies did not find any benefit from applying a sustained inflation in combination with PEEP. Now, there is one larger study by Aaron Tupas looking at almost 200 babies, 29 weeks, but this is a very complex trial. There are not just differences in sustained inflation, but there are many differences between the groups. So let's take a closer look. So the babies who are in the sustained inflation arm get a sustained inflation up to 10 seconds with a pressure of 20 to 25 centimeters of water, but they also get PEEP compared to the group that did not get a sustained inflation, who get no PEEP at that point in time. There was a difference in the device between the two arms. The sustained inflation group received 
the sustained inflation using a T-piece, and the babies who did not receive the sustained inflation got a self-inflating bag. They used a nasopharyngeal tube in the sustained inflation group, but a mask in the ones receiving no sustained inflation. So there are very there are more differences than just the sustained inflation. There are also differences in PEEP interface and the device that were used. They showed that if you look at the babies that need mechanical ventilation within the first 72 hours after birth, this was significantly reduced in favor of the babies getting the sustained inflation uh, uh, and the PEEP. In addition, they also showed that uh, there was a significant reduction in bronchopulmonary dysplasia at 36 weeks. So there seems to be a signal in there, a clinically relevant signal. The question is, how do we tease out which of all these factors is actually important and responsible for this uh, clinical reduction in BPD? Or maybe it's the whole package that's important. And this is difficult to tease out in this trial. If you look at just applying PEEP, to my knowledge, there's only one study looking at this from the NHHD network, where they randomized 100 very preterm babies and, uh, who were resuscitated by face mac and TPs to either applying CPAP or PEEP versus no CPAP or PEEP during transition, during these first minutes. And what they could show is that they had an equal amount of babies that needed intubation for resuscitation in the groups, and they found no differences on the short-term outcomes, but no longer outcomes were reported. So from this uh, study, small study, there wasn't a clear benefit of applying CPAP or PEEP during transition in these very low birth weight infants. So the question is, why is this different from the study done by the PUS? It could be that there was no sustained inflation in these babies, and this might be a very important part of getting a normal FRC. Could also be these are babies who are much uh, younger, 25 weakers, while in the TAPAS study there were 29 weakers. Might be a difference there also. So how do, would we, how do we deal with these data in, 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 in clinical practice? And these are just some considerations. So my view on, on uh, how we should deal with sustained inflation and PEEP, I guess it is extremely important, as always, that we try to individualize our treatment. So we have to look at our baby and see if this baby is a candidate for either sustained inflation or PEEP. If the baby is apneic, it might be a good idea to give a sustained inflation. As the baby is not breathing spontaneously and does not have the inspiratory and expiratory effort to create this air-filled FRC. But it might not be a good idea if the baby is spontaneously breathing, as we've shown that many of these babies have expiratory breaking and are probably quite capable of uh, aerating their lungs after birth. It might also be important to establish the surfactant status of the lung if there's uh, pretreatment with steroids and uh, no signs of surfactant deficiency. Um, this might not be a good idea to give a sustained inflation or give a lower PEEP uh, in these babies. And I think it's also very important to realize that if the baby is intubated or not, but as soon as we intubate our baby, we are bypassing the upper airway and the glottis, which play a very important role in the creation of a normal FRC. And just to show you this, I've got these videos from Aryan to Pus. These are uh, rabbit lungs in the singleton and gives you an idea of how lungs are aerated over time. And what you see here is a rabbit pup with a tube inside that is resuscitated without a sustained inflation with no peep, just positive pressure. And if we start the movie, you will see that when the first breath start in, you will see the trachea coming up there, and slowly you can see the widening of the lung as it fills with air. But what's more important, well, you build up these normal tidal volumes at the end of expiration, you can see with no peep that there's complete collapse or loss of aeration in these uh, um, uh, rabbit pups. Um, so this seems to me that there is probably some PEEP necessary to stabilize uh, the lung volume. This is shown in as an identical uh, experiment, but now we apply PEEP in addition to uh, positive pressure ventilation. Again, you can see that after the first breath, you get an aeration of the lung, but now you can see that the lung that, of the air that's entering the lung 
is actually stabilized by applying PEEP in these uh, uh, rabbit pups. The question is, how, of what is the optimal sustained inflation and or PEEP level we have to use? We don't know. So is it pressure that we should apply to these babies during transition or volume? We don't know. How long should the sustained inflation be? We don't know. Should we individualize? I guess we should, but how are we going to monitor when a pressure or a certain inflation time is sufficient to get normal lung aeration? So these are variables that still we need to figure out. So we're a long way of finding the optimal way of, of optimizing transition without a sustained inflation or PEEP. And we know that if we give too much pressure or too much volume to a preterm lung, that may cause injury and initiate a cascade of lung injury that will continue for many days, weeks, and months in these babies. However, based on our experience with the preterm infants below 30 weeks in our units, that these babies need some stabilization of lung volume with positive and exploratory pressure, I guess we should at least this category of baby apply PEEP during a pulmonary transition. Final question is, do the preterm infants need supplemental oxygen during pulmonary transition? Now, if you look at the literature, uh, so far there have been only a, a handful of small randomized controlled trials that have actually compared high versus a low FIO2 during resuscitation in preterm infants. And most of these trials did not show a consistent uh, effect on the short-term outcomes. What they all do have in common is most of these babies in trials that start on 21% of so room air actually do need oxygen during their resuscitation phase. So based on the evidence, there are no firm recommendations that can be made. I guess the basic thing would be is to avoid hypoxia and hyperoxia using the reference values, the percentiles that were uh, obtained by preterm infants that were unassisted during the pulmonary transition, which I showed you in the previous slide. And the primary focus should be on establishing normal FRC and ventilation. So the aim is improving heart rate and muscle tone and look for spontaneous breathing. We should monitor pedoctal sets as soon as possible, and we know from research from the Melvin Group that our eyes are deceiving us when we are trying to determine if a baby is actually pink and well saturated. I guess you could either start high or low, but the most important thing to do is to titrate your FI2 as soon as possible, aiming at this 50 percentile and trying to avoid both hyperoxia and hypoxia. And this is nicely illustrated by a study done by Max Vento in Spain, where they randomized preterm infants uh, during resuscitation to either what they called a low oxygen group, starting off at 30%, and a high oxygen group, starting off at 90%. And what they did, they really looked at the target range of the saturation and actively, dynamically titrated the FI2, trying to stay in these normal reference values. And what you can see is that there is a gradual increase in the first five minutes in the low oxygen group up to 50%, and there is a gradual decrease in the high oxygen group from 90% to also 50%, and from five minutes on, most of these babies have an identical uh, uh, FI2 to maintain normal saturations. And if you look at the way that the sets are progressing over time after birth, you can see that both of these approaches will give you normal saturations. Now, I don't know there are two big studies going on, uh, one in the US and one in Australia, uh, with a large group of babies targeting different FIR2s at birth. And we need to wait, I guess, uh, with the results of these trials before we can recommend, uh, like with the term baby, what percentage of oxygen we should start off in our babies. So to summarize, uh, pulmonary transition to preterm infant, um, they are at an increased risk of a compromised transition. Um, although there is a physiological rationale to use sustained inflation and PEEP, at least in the preterm baby with British apneic, um, the optimal settings um, and the long-term effects of a sustained inflation and PEEP uh, 
are still unclear. Um, and I guess most of these babies do require some supplemental oxygen, maybe starting off somewhere around 30% of oxygen, uh, and then titrating dynamically as soon as possible to the optimal targets. Um, so to wrap this all up, I guess the take home messages are most babies do not require pressure or oxygen during pulmonary transition. Um, if the assistance is needed, we should probably titrate it as much as possible, avoiding too much or too little. And the knowledge of normal physiology and pathophysiology is essential if we want to apply these uh, interventions uh, appropriately. And we have to wait for more research to make firm recommendations on the optimal support during pulmonary transition. Looking at because